Henry was born in Poland in 1928. His father was a tailor, and his mother raised a family of nine children. Before 1939, Henry pretty much had a typical childhood. He attended public and religious schools, played soccer, and did things that just normal boys do. 1939 came, and Germany invaded Poland. And he'll fill you in on the rest of the story. Following Henry, um, Henry comes to us from the Washington, D.C. area. Kent and I met uh, Henry about five years ago. We take our global health group to the Holocaust Museum. And Henry was there on, uh, on the day that he volunteers. And uh, one of our students um, met Henry. And uh, that's where our great friendship has uh, come from. Following Henry, um, then we'll be able to hear from Keith Davis. Keith is a local boy. He's from Springville. And his my wife, Marva, is sitting on the front row with us as well. He was born in 1924. Two days after graduating from high school, he joined the Army. And a few months later, he found himself in Europe and uh, in many campaigns in World War II in the European theater. He was uh, one of the first groups to enter any of the concentration camps in Europe and it happened to be Camp Ordruf in Germany and he was part of that liberating group. This is a quote that uh, the Daily Herald had in one of their articles about Keith. It said, I, I say that freedom is not free. God bless America. I started serving my country when I was 18 now I am almost 90, that's in December, and I am still serving. And uh, I am thankful every day of my life for men like Henry and Keith, their willingness to serve and to share and to help us remember the things that are important and the freedoms that we have. So gentlemen, we'll leave it to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Like we already heard that I was born in Poland, April 1st, 1928. We came from a family of nine children. We had three gir six girls and three boys. And we were running a tailor shop. We were in the tailoring business. I was the youngest of the nine. My father passed away just two months before the war. What, we had rumors from out of town what the German army or the Nazis like and dislike. We were told the rumors going around that if you worked in a factory, it might be beneficial for you. Shoemaker, tailor, carpenters, it didn't make a difference. That somehow, if you worked in a factory, it was beneficial for you. We stayed alive a little longer, especially in our town. It was a small town. We only had like 7,000 people. Jewish people in our town, and there was a lot of industry. And they kept us there for three years we stayed in our town. First thing they did is, when they, before the invasion of uh, our town, we'd like to, let me back up, before the, uh, the uh, Germans entered, we knew what they're like, we all got jobs in the factory. Before the army invaded us, we were already about a month or two working on the three sh different shifts, munition factory. My three sisters and I got a job there, and my father was the helper getting us the, the job because one of, the, one of our customers were either a manager in that factory or had some kind of big job in there. My father approached them after we heard the rumors from out of town. He said, can you give my children a job in your factory? He says, how many do you have? He says, three girls, single, and this young boy here. Now, but the boy was not even 12 years old. I was two months shy of 12 years old. And they gave us jobs. And we already proceeded going to work every day. 
in different weeks, you different shift. One, one week you had from 7 to 3, and then one week you had from, uh, from 3 to 11, and then the following week you had from 11 to 7 in the morning. So a lot of changes was going on. And we worked with non-Jewish people. They were on an assembly line. We were, you know, you cannot spend too much time just talking. You were busy working. So we did that, and they liked what we did. And so happened that they gave us our jobs. And we had IDs that we worked in the factory. My, after my father passed away two months before the war, my mom took over. She was starting to get more uh, to look after us. More, I don't know what the right word is. She was worried about us. So before the, she remembered from World War I what the Nazis came into Germany, into Poland, what they did. And there was nothing about killing or anything like that. Working you, you know, grabbing you to do things like that, yes. But no killing. So my mom, the sisters were ready to explore themselves. The women were able to, in the early days, they could go on a farm, and the farmer would give them a job. You know, they, a woman can do that. But the moms were too, too protective, and they couldn't think of the word before, protective. And she would say, no, you don't go nowhere. You stay right in this house. You can't go nowhere. You have to stay with me. And she wouldn't let none of the girls go even out of town. And you could still travel in those days. But everybody had to stay put in the house. Then before they entered our town, September the 10th, 1939, I believe it was, my mom decided to get the neighbor with a horse and buggy to take us 10 miles away on a farm so we wouldn't get hurt from the bombing and taking over our city with shrapnels and bombing and all that stuff. We were only 10 miles away. We could hear the noise. While we were there on the farm, the farmer put us up. He was a very nice man, not a Jewish man. He was a Gentile. And it was a Catholic, I believe it was Catholic people. They put us up for three days. We stayed the second day. My brother and I were out eating breakfast on the field outside on the farm. What did we eat? We took a big tomato off the vine. They still had the late September. They had tomatoes on the vine still, those big cluster tomatoes. And the farmer gave us a piece of bread. And that's what we were eating outside, me and my brother. And he was the third child. He had two sisters in front of him. So he was not the first child, he was the third child. So we were out there and never got back into the farm to get a glass of milk to go with the breakfast that we had because all of a sudden a Polish soldier appeared out of nowhere. He came running through the area where we are. And it so happened my brother knew of his first name. I don't know how he knew him. Was he a customer of ours? Or was he maybe the, uh, the guards of the city? Maybe he was not a really army man, but he had quite a few medals on him. But the uniform was a little bit torn. He was dragging along a broken bike with him. And my brother stopped him and he said, where are you running from? He says, the German army is three kilometers and they're coming this way. And the Polish soldier didn't want to get caught by the German army to become a prisoner. So he was running away in the opposite direction. I could not believe my ears. My oldest protector, my buddy, my, my big brother says, is it okay if I go along with you? The Polish soldier did without hesitation. He said, of course, sure, you can come with me. So the boat took off. And I, being a little boy, I was not quite 12 years old. And there goes my protection. I don't know, my father's already passed away. And one of the brothers was in the Polish army fighting the war with the, with the Germans. He was 10 years older than I was at the time. And he was in the army, so I was meaning, I was left alone with the, with the three girls and my mom. So after my, so I was hiding behind bushes, which way they were going. Every time I lift up my head, my brother turned around and said, go back to your mother, go back to your mother. But of course I didn't listen to him, so I chased him a couple of miles. It was nothing for a young boy to run a few miles. And then he just, the soldier turned around, the Polish soldier, he put his hands on the mouth real loud, he says, go back to your mother. Okay, okay. And I went back to my mom. 
and told her inside the farmer's house what really happened to Brother Dave. Oh, she was carrying on. Who's going to make, who's going to run the shop? It was a small shop. Who's going to run it? If the, he's the only one supposed to be in charge of it, if the father passed away, he, because the, one of the brothers was in the army, so he was supposed to run the, the shop. But she was upset, crying, carrying on. She got over it. We all, on the third day, packed up from the farm, we on the horse and buggy. We went back to a little house. We came back to the house, and we were near a railroad station. So they, they bombed the station. Some of the shrapnels came into our house. Mom's always right, somebody could have got hurt, but luckily we didn't. We fixed everything back to normal, and but then the Germans occupied our city, September of 39. So there, myself, I was very frightened of them. They didn't do anything to me, but I just didn't like the looks of them. With the helmets, with every one of them had a gun, a rifle, and the boots, they looked scary for me. They looked like a Goliath. I was a little boy, they looked like Goliaths to me. I was a nice little Jewish boy. I had the curls here. I had my tassels sticking out, uh, hanging out. I had little boots on. Oh, that, that's not Jewish enough. About a month later, or two weeks later, they had to, we had to wear the yellow star of David. I was already looking Jewish, but they had to put me a, a, a yellow star of David in the front and the back. And I, from, from a little child on up to, if you were 100 years old, you had to wear it. I went to public school. I came and the teacher says, no school for Jewish children anymore now. No school. So what child doesn't like to hear that? No school. But we didn't know it's going to last 10 years. I mean, five years. We didn't know it's going to be five years. Like my kids here, when, when they were growing up, if there was a bad snowstorm, no school the next day, Oh, they were the happiest guys, yeah, no school. So I thought of that kind of thing, but mine lasted for five years. And no school at all. We did were able to sneak in Hebrew school in somebody's house. And somebody had to watch outside to see if the army was coming. Then we all hid their head or disappeared, dispersed. It was only about maybe 10 of us that were still learning the, about the uh, Jewish Bible. And we kept on the, the you could, all of a sudden, they had curfew. You could not leave town anymore after that because they were threatened to kill you if, they, if you leave town. And they you could not go to a movie. You could not play with other children like I was playing soccer, mainly soccer with other kids. Some not Jewish, some Jewish. We had games going around. We were happy, happy, be lucky children. Then all of a sudden, they give you a curfew, and you cannot leave town. Then the later on, they started to put us in like a ghetto. There were other people living in the same area, non-Jews, but they were free to leave and come whenever they want to. With us, they want the barbed wire, the intersection. We were still in our little houses, and, and they had this intersection with the barbed wire, and then they had an opening the two soldiers were guarding with the dogs. So you could not come out of there if you were a Jew. The only way you could come out of there if you could show the guard the ID that you worked in the factory. That's the only time you could come out of this ghetto area. And we were surrounded by almost three small little, short little blocks that most of us lived near the synagogue anyway. I had two Samaritan sisters. They didn't live in that area. They lived in the suburbs a little bit further out. And so they found out after we were in the ghetto area, there's some more Jews around here, they found out. They got the city police to show them where did the Jews live. And they had a special group, Einsatzgruppen, the killing unit, would come with the little pickup trucks with the city police and show them this is the Jew house right here. And they went in and busted the door down with a the rifle. They loved chaotic stuff. They're not I knock on the door, excuse me, you have to leave. No way, you have to break down, causing a lot of, a lot of excitement. And rouse, rouse, they were screaming, and the dogs were barking, and there was a lot of chaos. And they don't, you can't ask questions, where are you taking me? Just grab whatever, what do you grab? Your children are first, I guess. And if you have any valuables, you grab them with you. And they took you on those little trucks, and they brought you into where we were in the ghetto. 
with the three block perimeter and made it overcrowded. And you, all your valuables, your stuff that you left in the house stayed in the house. Pictures or money, if you didn't take everything with you, I don't know how they worked. But we were in this ghetto with the, and they got overcrowded, of course. And then we ran out of food. We had to depend on the German army to bring our food in. And every week it would get less and less and less. Well, we were complaining that we were not starved to dead yet. We had enough to survive. Then all of a sudden, they decided one day they didn't let anybody go. The three shifts could not go to work anymore. We had to stay put in the ghetto. And they ordered an extra guards and extra dogs. And they chased us, everyone out. No one could go to work. So everybody was in this three block perimeter. We stayed in there. They chased us out of that area to a more open field. And they walked up. One went here, one went here. I'll give you the picture of my family. I walked up with my mother, with my three sisters, and the two married from five sisters all total. The two married ones had little kids with them. They were not quite seven years old. And they walked up. My mom went over to one side. Then they took the married sisters and the two little, they, uh, they were not quite seven years old, over to the same side where grandma was, and the two of my sisters one. And then they start with us, the single ones. We showed them the ID that we had a job in the factory, over to the other side. So we, that helped us. The ID helped us right there. But we went over to the other side because we were able bodies and working. A woman pregnant come up, went over the same side they had, uh, where they married with little children were. A woman who just gave childbirth went over to the same side, handicapped over to the same side. At the end of the day, we were all separated. They took half of our population of the Jews away from us, the elderly and the handicapped, and some women were strong women. They had children with them, but they were strong if they were willing to take the kids and give them to grandma, they would definitely save them for a while to go to work. But what mother's going to give up the children? They go with them where the children goes. So my sisters did that. At the end of the day, we were separated. And we saw from a distance, we saw the freight cars sitting on the rail over there. And they marched all those people away from us. We didn't know where to take them. There was no way that you could get information from nobody. We didn't know till after the war where they took him. They took him to a place called Treblinka, nothing but a killing center. All those people were loaded up. They went from city to city. When they arrived at, at, uh, at that place where the, uh, where the killing was done, Treblinka, they were full capacity, the trains. 24 hours a day, we were told. The trains would roll in there, and they would un let them unload and they were directed towards the shower room. They had to undress naked, and they went into the shower room, and they never came out of life out of the shower room because they were gassed to death with their children, with their women separate from the men, of course, but grandmas and, and their daughters and the grandchildren all went together, and they gassed them to death, and then they, and then they cremated them. And we did not know in those days by any cremation. We didn't know about any uh, gazing to death. All we had, where we came from, hanging and shooting, yes. Or oh, killing you with a rifle over the head, with a rifle butt, yes. That we did have. We didn't find out until we came to the other camps that finally we found out about that killing the other ways. Anyway, they took them away. We didn't know till after the war. Don't look for them because we were looking for the family. We thought that maybe they're strong women. Maybe they killed the children. Maybe they killed the elderly. My mom was only 54 years old, considered old, I guess. And she went away with their two daughters and the grandchildren. She never came out alive. We told at the time we were traveling after the war. We were traveling in different camps. We didn't have to pay for transportation. So we came into one camp that was called Bergen Belgian and was liberated by the, I mean, liberated by the British Army. And they were the British zone. We came in there, they only gave us three days, so you can only say, I only asked for one day, because I didn't even want to be with the British. I don't, with me, I liked the American soldiers better. I had a sister living in America. I knew 
if I stick to the American soldiers, I'll someday be in America. I thought maybe if I get tangled up with the British and they take me to Britain, I'll never come out to see my sister in America. That was in my head. So that's what I was thinking about those. Anyway, they turned around after they took those people away from us. They turned around to us, chased us for six kilometers uphill. We arrived at the destination, and on the way, they were whipping us with long whips, just like the cowboy round up cows here, just whipping you, or, the, or if you didn't jog too fast, they were in the hurry to get up to the place where they wanted us. We finally arrived at our destination, six kilometers uphill, but there was a, a slave labor camp built for us in the outskirts of the city. We never went back into the ghetto. Whatever you left in the ghetto stayed in the ghetto. Or if you left some valuables there, if you did, that was too bad, it stayed there. But they chased us uphill, and the loudspeaker came on, attention, attention, you must empty all your pockets, all the money, jewelry, whatever you have, into a box. And everybody obeyed, nobody got hurt. I, myself, I didn't have a thing with me. I was a young boy, I didn't have it. My sister had little watches, necklaces, you know, women usually have that. And they, they gave it all up. They had to give it up. Nobody got hurt. One guard was at the gate going in. They furnished us with a three foot long, with a three foot wide blanket rolled up. Every camp I went, they gave us, they gave us a little blanket. And then the other guard was at the barrack. It's the first time I noticed a barrack, a wooden shack. That's all it was sitting on stilts. That's all it was. I never went to do this before because when we were in the ghetto, we lived in our own little houses. And you put up other people too on top of each other. But we didn't have any barracks. But once we got up there to the slave labor camp, there was two fence uh, camp, six foot fence. One was barbed wire, one was wood. And then the tower and the guards. And they ordered us to come past the gate and give up everything. And then the one soldier was at the uh, barrack, and there was enough capacity in there that to fill up, the, I don't know how many they put in, 100 or 75 to sleep in the barrack, I don't know how many. But at the time, he gave them the signal that it was enough, that the, the capacity is full to go to another barrack to send them over to the other one. It took a whole day almost, the rest of the day, to get through to all situated. And then we all finally got into the barracks. We came in there, there were bunks, nothing but shelves, wooden shelves. No mattress, no straw, nothing was on it. Just gave us a little blanket. And we figured out with the blanket, we use it as a pillow. Because otherwise you had a board sticking up on the back and to lay on the top. You could not lay on your back anyway. 75 inches wide, three guys had to sleep together like that. They did the same with the women. Three persons. You could never lay on your back to rest because only on the side. One turn, the next one had to turn. And that's what they punished us in there in this slave labor camp. And we stayed there the next morning. They woke us up early in the morning. They gave us a little piece of slice of bread, a little imitation coffee, and we lined up for work. We lined up for work. We already had the IDs that we worked in the factory. Well, then they filled in able-bodied people that they saved. They didn't all send them away. They were younger, strong. They saved them. And they were sent with us to the factories. We came through the guardhouse, and the chaos starts again with the whips. They always like chaos, just, just causing trouble for no reason at all. These new people didn't know where to go. They followed us in wherever we went to the factory, and then they the manager would give them, assign them to different jobs. And finally, we did that. And we stayed in this slave labor camp for another year. Two years in the ghetto, one year in the slave labor camp. And we became very dirty, filthy, because we were wearing the same clothes from day one in the ghetto. So three years, we were wearing the same clothes. We all got lice infested. They did not cut our hair or the women's hair. Everybody got long hair and lice had a, they had a, a haven where to stay in, the, in your head, in the hair. That's where they all originate. And we all, lice infestation, and when they started, you sleep in such close quarters, when finally the typhoid epidemic broke out in the wintertime, because in the summer, you were a man can 
we had a pump of cold water in our vicinity. So in the summer, you can undress from the waist on up. They wouldn't give us soap. We used dirt from out of the ground and put us like a mud bed on there or rub all over the mud on you. And the next person would pump the water and clean yourself off a little bit. But they didn't kill the lice in the hair, which were cold water, they were still alive. And then we all got lice infested and then the typhoid epidemic broke out for about, I would say, at least a half a year that this sickness carried on. And then the Einsatz group and the killing unit had a picture, I, they had a picnic, rather, with this, because they came in every morning with those little pickup trucks, and they parked them around near the each barrack one. They knew the barrack, let's say, hold 100. And if only maybe 80 is outside, where are the other 20? There sometimes were five missing, sometimes 20, but more likely like three, four, five, six, up to 10, they were in there. They could not line up for work because they couldn't get off the bunk because they contained, they caught the typhoid epidemic, very f high fever. You can't stop on your feet, on the, on the legs, like rubber legs, like you, are, like you are drunk. You can't, so you, that's the reason you didn't line up for work. They knew that, so they were put on the top of those little wagons or those little pickup trucks. And from barrack to barrack, when they were full of capacity, the people would not line up for work. It so happened that they had three stages of the high fever, middle fever, low fever. I caught low fever. I worked every day. I went to work. My uh, oldest sister, Fager, she had also low fever. The youngest of the girls, Ida, I-T-A, she died of typhoid. And Chaya, Harriet, she, the uh, killing unit, picked her up and put her on truck. And the reason I know she was on the truck, I just got back from the night shift, and they wouldn't let us in. They kept us between the two fences. They sent off the ice, the morning shift first, the day shift, and then they let the night shift come in and go to sleep, or get your food, and then go to sleep. And that so happened, we did that, and then they were counting, and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, they, they didn't like what they saw. They kept picking all these people up, and they took them to the outskirts of the town. And when they put us, the minute they put us on the Yellow Star of David, they grabbed us in the street that time. And then we had to dig trenches for them in the outskirts of the town. And those trenches, we were told at that time, were for tanks to fall in. But they knew what they were doing. We didn't have cremation. We didn't have any, any gas chambers, so shooting and hanging, and whoever died on their own, they would take them off to these trenches that the Einsatzgruppe would pull up with their trucks, they under us naked, and they were shot to death into the ditch they went. And until the ditch was full, they went to the next one. We took two months for us to dig these trenches. I don't know how many we, we dug that time, but that's what mostly were used for people with the typhoid epidemic that they shot. They didn't line up for work. And eventually, eventually, it wore itself off. Eventually, for about six months, it carried on. Some died on their own. Yes, my, my sister, the youngest, did. And then other people, they were shooting because they didn't line up for work. And then my oldest of my sisters decided they asked for volunteer tailors. And my, we came from a tailor family. My sister, she got a job as a tailor, 50 tailors of 75 tailors were working on the army uniforms for the Nazis. Make in, take out, let out, put patches on, new ones. And one day, uh, the high-ranking officer came into the, to the tailor shop and told the tailors, you must have all these uniforms ready by such and such date, because all of you are going to be deported. And those tailors didn't like what they heard. They said, we helping them with their war machinery for three years here with a little piece of bread and coffee and the water, cabbage soup at night. They didn't have to spend that much money on our food. So they're probably going to kill all of us because they don't need us anymore. Although we, were, we helped them with the war machinery. We worked in the factory. Just, we did perform like the non-Jews did. So what happened is then, then they loaded us up and they took the sick ones that they came and then these tailors organized an escape out of nowhere. They went amongst each other first, 
They said, let's pick a date, and we're going to run out of here one day. I was already 15 years old that time, and my sister would not tell me, but they escaped till the night before. And my shift was from 3 in the afternoon to 11 at night. It was pitch dark. It was dark. Maybe it was an air raid in the vicinity. It was pitch dark. And my sister came by after I got off from the factory, stayed outside waiting for her. She came with a Jewish policeman. She was holding his hand. She grabbed my hand. We all ran out. We were running towards the hall where somebody else cut through. And it so happened, maybe 10 feet away, people, but there was one fence barbed wire, one fence was wood. To cut open a hole in the fence with the barbed wire was quietly, but they had to break on the wooden fence, made a little noise, and they, that attracted the German Shepherd police dogs, and they were barking and growling. It so happened that the, that the guards knew something is bad happening, so they flipped the lights on. They flipped the lights on, so people were running out so they put the guns on them, and they kept shooting them. Some wounded, some run out. And then all of a sudden they turned the gun on us. We were in another group trying to go in bunches to not to all appear to block the hole. So we in the bunches we go out. And he turned the, the gun on us, and the bullet struck the back of my head as I was holding my sister and the policeman holding my sister. And I dropped on the ground, and I woke up a few seconds later full of blood running down. First thing I did is I felt my head. I didn't have a hole in it. So I said, I looked like I, somebody cut a two inch a, a gash in my, in my skull, like the skin. And I was bleeding furiously. I lowered my head and I said, my sister would not leave me here and run out unless they killed her. I didn't know what to do. So I decided my decision was lower my head and sneak into the women's barrack. It was in the opposite direction. I ran there, lowered my head, and as the floodlights were running back and forth, and they kept shooting everywhere. Whoever was outside, they picked them up. Luckily, they didn't see me anymore after that. It was towards the evening. And I lowered my head, and I, I still made it into the woman's barrack. I come to the woman's barrack. The lady that's in charge of the barrack knew me her name. I knew her name. She was from my city, and she was guarding the, the that was her barrack. She was like the block elves that they were called in charge of the barrack. You can't stay here, your sister is not here. I said, how did you know my sister is not here? I know your sister Fake is not here. I said, no, I don't believe you. I said, and I sat in the doorway. She was trying to push me out. At 15 years old, I was a little stronger than she was, and she was trying to get me to close the door. She could not close the door. And I was afraid to go out there, because if they catch me with a bullet uh, wound in the back of my head, I give myself away, I will, I'll be uh, next, uh, kill me next time. I won't be so lucky next. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden uh, they turned the guns around and they kept shooting on, on us. And they, the bullet did strike my head and, uh, and then everybody was dispersing, dispersing. They were all running in different direction, back to their barracks, never mind escaping anymore because they were guarding that hole. So anybody that too close to that hole, they would be dead. So the next morning, the shooting started, stopped rather. During the night, they were so angry, people stopped running out, that he took the two guns that were standing on top of the, of the tower, and they kept shooting into the barracks. Three, four bullets came into the women's barrack. All the women jumped off. I don't know if anybody got shot in the barrack, that I don't remember. But they all jumped off the bunks, and they all sat down on the ground. And I happened to be on the ground, too, because the woman was trying to push me out the door. And then, so I was eye level with all of them, and I could not see my sister. But I recognized our first cousin, Ida. She says, what happened to you? I told her we were trying to escape with Fager, and I was wounded, and I can't find Fager. Is she here? She's not here. Trust me, I know she's not here. I know what bunk she was. She's not here, but let me help you. She helped me with the bleeding. She stopped the bleeding for me with rags and water, warm water. She stopped it and then a dry rag on top of my wound. She took her beret off that she was wearing. I should put the beret on to keep the rag inside. I still have to get out of there, but if they catch me in the woman's barrack, I'll be dead. So I have took a little bit. I could still run pretty good. I lowered my head as I got out of the barrack. 
and that lady's barrack was also away, the same as my barrack with the man, also on the opposite direction. But you had to figure out the floodlights, which way they were going, how long will it take you? So I figured it out by almost counting, and all of a sudden I lowered my head, and I dashed out, and I made it into my barrack where I belong. Thank God I'm safe now. A few minutes later, the loudspeaker came on, everybody else was mourning already. Everybody aroused out of the barrack. They wanted to each, everybody be in the front of the barrack. The night shift just came back. They were not in the, involved in the escape because they were working in the factories. So they wouldn't let them in until they counted the group that's still there to get some idea how many escaped. And that's what they were doing. So after the counting, they still didn't let them in. Then he told us to turn a different direction. We went to the direction where the hall was. And right there, I looked at the policeman I was trying to escape with. He was sitting in the upright position, moaning and groaning. We were only a few feet away from it. And moaning and groaning. Other people moaning and groaning because they were wounded. Where they were shot at, I don't know. But they were still alive. Instead of giving medication, maybe they would have survived. But uh, the medication was take his gun and turn it on all the wounded people right in the front of our faces. They kept shooting every one of them. First one was the policeman. When he tilted over, there goes my sister Fagin, laying stretched out by his legs. Before he was sitting up, he was blocking my view. I could not see her. But once he dropped over, she was stretched out already dead. She must have got shot with the same bullet I did and made it to the hall and just fell over, tilted over, and died maybe that way. That's the way I figured it out. And he killed all the wounded ones, and he said, you cannot escape anymore after that because we will kill you. And sure enough, after that, they let the night shift in. We went normal for a couple of weeks, and the day came, and the deportation started, like the high-ranking officer said in the beginning. We were going to go on and be deported. The trucks came, we loaded up on trucks, and the truck took us to the railroad yard, to the station, and we were loaded up on the freight cars. We were traveling for three days, no water, no bathroom, and yelling and screaming every time we stopped. Water, water in different languages, in unison, we were screaming, so they can hear miles away as much as we were screaming. They never opened the door, they never gave us anything. We finally arrived at that destination in the early evening. It was Auschwitz-Birkenau. As the doors opened up, they kept yelling with their dogs, and the uniform guys were standing in front. Raus, aus, aus, everybody aus. And as they come off the truck, of the, uh, come off the train, another selection all of a sudden, left, right, left, right. They just took simultaneously who they wanted on one side, or who would they want on the other side. How they, they came up with that idea, I don't know. But we never saw the half of our group. The way we understand from the people who were there before us that those people were taken straight to the crematorium for gazing chamber. And we were not aware of that till the next day because we kept asking the inmates the next day, what's smelling something here like burning flesh? We saw little gray particles flying around like a snowstorm. There were the ashes. They explained to us what they're doing. And when we came home, we didn't have that. We had shooting and hanging. And there, they, they coast you into the, to the shower, and the shower is the end. You never come out alive by the shower room. Anyway, they took them away from us. We were lucky. I was lucky, too. They sent me over to the good side. The good side means they gave you a tattoo on the arm. That's the first thing they did. My number was A18991, a tattoo number. The next stop was a, hair, a, a barber on a chair. There was a few of them. They were Jewish guys. They were cutting with a hand clipper. And he cut my hair. He saw the wound on my head, but I was not afraid of him. He was Jewish, and we were talking in Jewish, and I was not afraid of him. So he, how did it happen? I told him my sister and I were trying to escape with the policeman, and they were both killed and I was wounded. Didn't say another word, next in line. And we over to the third stop, finally a shower after three years, no shower. That we didn't have in the ghetto. We would, that's the last time we had a shower. And, and it was called the mikvah that time. Whatever they had it in there, we were cleaning up ourselves. 
in the air because it was in the vicinity where we were. But for three years, we didn't wash it off. We came into Auschwitz-Birkenau, and there, in the third stop, they took away our clothing full of lice. And believe it or not, they gave us soap to clean up. But we were so thirsty that we first drank all the water we could exhume, all the water, because we didn't have water for three, four days. And we did drink the water, then cleaned ourselves out nice. They took away our filthy clothes from us, and they put it on a, on a uh, conveyor. And I guess I went through a heat, certainly to kill the lice in it. But they, gave them, they, did, they took away those clothes from us. They furnished us with striped uniforms. That was our clothing that we were, from day one, we were wearing it, and that's why we wore it for three years. And that's how the life started, because you didn't, you wore the slip, the clothes, you wore the clothes to work, you never washed, except for the summer a little bit. I don't know, the women had kept themselves clean, that I don't know. But anyway, everybody got their uniform, and they gave us a three-foot blanket, the three-foot wide blanket, ordered in us to a barrack. The barracks were the same as the, the barrack we left before, the same thing. And then a German civilian man came in to Auschwitz-Birkenau looking evidently for free labor. And we were still in pretty good condition. We were able-bodied, we still couldn't work. So this civilian man came in with two guards on, with him and the two dogs, and he ordered our barrack outside, and whoever he liked, he called you over to him. And you better listen to, ask no question, what are you picking me for? You had to, when he pointed at you, over you got. They took 50 out of the barrack, and he marched us out of there, and he took us to a nearby camp called Buna, B-U-N-A, Manowitz, a subcamp of Auschwitz. And we, that man was either a manager or the owner of a company called IG Farben. There was a chemical company. I understand they, the producers of the cyclone gas. They made rubber tile, uh, uh, rubber automobile tires, bicycle tires, bullets, synthetic fuel. But the man that chose us to go do the work over there is to build a small strip of road with cobblestones and a sidewalk. But that time when we start maybe one, one third into the, to the working, building the roads, the American Army finally decided to come, the Air Force, and bomb IG factory, and they, they bombed the rail leading into IG. So they knocked out, so they, they couldn't receive any, any supplies, they couldn't ship out any supplies. And then we were still building, and then they got the Army, the Air Force got very more aggressive, and they knocked out the whole IG Farben company. They were, as soon as the airplanes came, the siren was blowing, they had a, a bunker. The bunker was not for us. The bunker was for the non-Jews who worked there, German people, mostly or Polish people, and then also for the uh, guards and the dogs. They ran for the bunker. We were left outside by ourselves, by ourselves outside. And then while they were doing the British was bombing, they went in, they went in, uh, in uh, I, I, I tried to listen to what you guys said. <laughs> it threw me off. <laughs> and, and That's what we're here for. <laughs> to throw you off. Yes. They, they, they started coming more aggressive. They knocked out. We ran into, one bombing came, the first one. We ran into eight or ten British war prisoners. They came by with a little push cart, picking up their, they had an easy job. They were still in their uniforms. Their shoes were shined. They clean uniforms, they were shaved clean like they shake showers. They're the ones that told us, this is American Air Force bombing you guys here. Don't give up, don't never give up. They know you're here. Don't give up. Stay alive. And someday they'll come. They came back and knocked out the whole, I, the whole IG. So they took us on the trains, then they took us trying to take us to another uh, train stop, uh, either um, Flossenburg was the one, but I was told I was in another camp before Flossenburg. Um, I forgot the name already. Uh, anyway, another camp, a transit camp. We only stayed there maybe, maybe a week or two. That's why I didn't put it in my story. That were told that, that I, at Flossenburg. And then I was wound up in Flossenburg. We stayed a few months in Flossenburg. We stayed there. Our job that we arrived 
was bundling up clothing from people who they murdered. It was a heap of clothes like uh, one story high, bundling up coats, coats, pants, pants, shoes, hats. And they were sending that stuff back to Germany for recycling. That was our job at the, when we arrived in Flossenburg. Mind you, well, one day I touched till in, in your home, yesterday about the, about, the, uh, about the Red Cross. A few days before the Red Cross came to visit our camp all of a sudden, they made us clean up the area real good with brooms. They brought in two soccer goalies. They brought us in a football to play football, to play soccer. You were so weak you could not even hit the ball. To kick the ball, they were so weak. But they were standing and talking amongst each other. Now, we, every camp that we went, our dinner was cabbage soup, cabbage water. That's all it was. It would be a good idea if they would put cabbage water. I had a spoon tied up to my pants, which I never took off in four years. There was nothing to spoon. All this loose water soup. You drank it out of the bowl, you know, and bother with a spoon, you know. And that day in Flossenburg, we didn't get cabbage water to eat. They got cream of wheat. Now, are these, are these uh, Red Cross blindfolded that they couldn't see our faces, that we don't get fed with cream of wheat every day? Would we look the way we look? No, I don't think so. But they talked amongst each other. They wouldn't let us go near them. They just pointed at us that we very good. They play ball here, and they have a good life here. We don't, we don't kill them here. But every corner you went, there was a guardhouse built with brick, and the gun was sticking out. The gun was moving around always. And I saw those same things when I visited. A couple months, I went back to those places. I went back. The guardhouse is still there, but nobody with a gun pointing at me. So I, said, I waved it. I said, thank you, they God. They, you, you, I hope you're in hell, you know. <laughs> Before you could not, wherever you went, there was a gun pointing at you. In one place they had, I'll never forget, they had in Flossenburg, they had a bunch of either potatoes or well, I don't know what they were used, the potatoes, we never got it, or, or, or these other things that were laying a bunch of. He was standing outside in the guard, inside, with the gun pointing at this bunch of potatoes. And people are hungry. They run over, they grab one. And once they grab one, that's it. It's the end of them right there. You kill them right there. You shoot them. And those guards were still, the guard houses were still there in Flossenburg. And the part of the fence, the electric fence was still there that I visited. It brought back a lot of memories. Of course, sad. My children were the three sons. I took them with, very angry. How did the world let it happen like that? And how can they be so inhuman to do something to human beings, to do the way they were treated? We went to barracks, we went to crematorium. They visited us. I was trying to keep my composure. I didn't want to get the two boys, the three boys upset. And I had one of them who married a daughter about two weeks later, so I didn't want to get in any situation where it could be some confrontation that he won't be able to get back home and go to the wedding. So I, we kept low, low profile. But we spent there about four days. It was a reunion. Anyway, from Flossenburg, we stayed. We stayed there. We, all of a sudden, we heard that the American army was coming to liberate Flossenburg. But we thought they were Russians because we figured out near the Czechoslovakian border, the Russians would be closer. But no, the Americans came. But three days before, they had us empty out the camp, and we, they put us on, on the, the, car, the cattle cars, and we in deeper into Germany, in Bavaria, Austria, Czechoslovakia. And riding in that days, they had some women in open cars, half cars, they were already there. But the Air Force came back, and they were bombing every day. And eventually, they knocked out the whole rail. And we came to a town called Schwarzfield. Something Schwarz means black something. And there may be a field or maybe the trees were black. I don't know the reason. But the train was so close to the forest, like you can almost touch the trees in that, in that area. And all of a sudden, the Air Force came and knocked the heck out of that locomotive. And then they knocked some of the cars out. And one, of, one car was the SS in there, a car full of them. They were in a certain car with them, enjoying themselves, celebrating themselves. They, they, aban they had to abandon the, the wagons, and they screamed at us to jump out. They opened the doors for us to run into the wooded area. We 
but you could not run away too far because they had the dogs laying there. They, you had to run into the woods and drop. You could not be on your feet, otherwise they would kill you. And this, the Americans knocked out that time the whole, the whole, uh, the whole train. And then they put us later on on foot. We marched for two months, February to the 25th of April. We had to march. They didn't know what to do with us. From camp to camp, nobody wanted to take us in. They were overcrowded, or they didn't want to bother with us, so we kept marching. We kept, the only way we got a raw potato on the trip, if the two guards were hungry, the dogs were hungry. They located a farm. They would go into the farm and had themselves a good meal. It was their people, German people. They were right there, so I'm sure they had a good dinner. The order was to the farmer to give us one raw potato, and that was our dinner, and some water to drink. And we marched again after they finished. And then on the, 20, on the 24th of April, they marched us into a farm, and all of a sudden they became very kind. They led us into a silo where they keep the hay, and we kept joking with one another. They probably couldn't put a match on there, put the hay in there, and burn us all up. But the doors were laying outside at the door. At the doors, you could not open even the door before these wild animals would come and get you. They're very aggressive dogs. They could eat you up. If you see on some of the pictures, they wear the, one of the dogs wear the muzzle. It's the eyes. If you look at that dog, you're just too scared to look at him. Anyway, nobody left the silo. We stayed in there. We got in from the April showers. We were soaking wet. We took our clothes off, wringed them out, and laid them down on the hay to dry. The next morning, they were not quite dry, and they all of a sudden woke us up early in the morning, and then they only marched us for two hours. They gave us a raw potato on the way out, and some water, and then marched. They marched only for two hours. They put us near a wooded area, and we could see the highway, and we saw a lot of war equipment, tanks, and jeeps and all kind of war stuff we saw. It, we didn't know. We, were thought, we, were, we thought that this was the German army. We didn't know who they were. And airplanes low flying overhead. We still didn't know the markings on the equipment. Out of nowhere, the two guards that were guarding us, silently, they took off and they ran away from us. They left us by ourselves. We couldn't figure out what happened. So we figured out later what happened because the American army was only maybe a block and a half away. And they were too afraid to use their rifle to kill us because they would give themselves away. The rifle makes a lot of noise when you fire a rifle. So they didn't want to get caught by the American army. So they snuck away, they got into a farm. I didn't see it, but I'm sure that's what they did. They changed their uniform to civilian clothes. They're just another German. And that's how they saved themselves. Out of nowhere, while we're sitting there, a tank took over from the main highway towards us. And as it got closer to us, we didn't know it was an American tank. We thought it was a German tank. So we said, now they're for sure going to kill us, every one of us now. So we stayed there with anticipation and waited. And all of a sudden, the tank stopped, the hatch opens up, and this beautiful American soldier, America written here, on the, on the uh, front of his uniform. It was a tight squeeze for him to get out of the hatch, out of the tank, like a genie out of a bottle. He squeezed himself out. <laughs> and then he says, put, and then he put his hands on the mouth, and he says, we are Americans, and all of you are free. I still get goosebumps when I come to that part of the story that the word free. I just get, get shakes after putting up five years with with the, t with the stuff that they had, beatings, and see my family disappearing by the, by a, uh, the way I was left alone. So I said to, after that, no, after that, he yelled to his partner on there, dump out all the rations that you have on the tank. He dumped them out. But we were fighting like cats and dogs trying to grab a ration. We were so hungry. So he saw we were going to kill us, each other. So he stopped. Somebody must have spoke English in my group. See, the order was, Leave the rations where they are and follow my tank. Don't follow on the side of the tank, but in the back of the tank. And he took us out of the wooded area. There wasn't much, much wood because we were more out than in, and took us across the field, across the road. We got across the road, and there we saw a house, a farmer's house. The American soldier got over to the door, and the other soldier, sign language, for us to go in, of course. And then we looked and we said, are we going to go in? because we saw outside the farmer's house 
three big pails of potato peelings with white flour on there. And we were so hungry, you were looking at the steak. You were so hungry. And we ate up without spoons, no spoons. Just dump it in your mouth, as much, feed, as much potato peelings as we emptied out the trays. And then we went in. Once we come inside, we said, why did we eat all these peelings? They had a table full of normal food out there. The <laughs> Americans tried to come in for us to eat. And I, we were not aware that they had already liberated people there from the night before. And they ate all this good food. But guess what? They were sick as dogs from eating the good food because their stomachs couldn't digest the good food. Or maybe they overate. I don't know the answer. But they kept yelling, doctor, doctor, doctor. And these two American uh, soldiers had to call for reinforcements. They called for the medics to come. And they dialed that funny phone number. Now you have these little things. You got in two minutes, you get in touch with the person. In those days, you had to crank a phone. I don't know how many days. It took them three days to come. They came to this house, and they gave everybody medication. I walked up to one of them, showed them the wound on my head. I had a scab already, but the underneath it was infected. And they, I couldn't go to the German and show them my wound on the head. They would finish me off. So I didn't want to say nothing. Long hair covered it all up. Well, the soldier gave me a sign like this. I didn't know what that, what that meant. Like, it's OK, I guess. And then he shaved part of my head, or hair or around the wound. He put a medication. He put a bandage. And I was free. And, and also, I was at the age of 17. And I survived all this misery. And thanks to you guys, because you came and helped us along. And you are witnesses. Because you have quite a few people don't believe it happened. As much as I talk and talk and hear. <laughs> and I go to the museum on Friday. I almost have at least 500 children on a Friday come there, field trips. And every one of them, how was it? Don't you have questions? No. The teacher doesn't, they don't uh, uh, prepare them. So they rather you tell them. So you keep repeating yourself over and over and over. At the end of the day, you had enough of it. But anyway, thank you so much for helping. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me here. May God bless all of you. And may God bless the United States of America, the best country in the world. Nobody ever refuses to come here. Everybody wants to come here to complain. The president, <laughs> this one, that one. But it's still the best place to be in the world. It's America. Thank you. Th thank you, Henry. Thank you very much. So after hearing uh, Henry's story a little bit, anybody want to complain about the reading assignment this week? <laughs> so uh, Keith is now going to tell us a little bit about his experience of being a part of the Liberators and going into camps. And Keith's, uh, Keith's telling us his story. Then if you have questions, we'd uh, welcome you to, to uh, ask questions. You're going to have to stand up and yell really loud so we can get the uh, questions. We come upon the order of concentration camp. When we, when our soldiers went into the camp, the, the uh, prisoners were terrified of our, of us because we had on uniforms. They thought they were in for more, more torture and cruelty. They soon found <coughs> out we were there, we were there not to harm them. When we. Uh, uh, these prisoners were dressed in pajama-like clothing with black and white vertical stripes, and some of them were naked. When we, just before we arrived at the order of concentration camp, the Nazi uh, guards fled the camp. But before they fled the camp, they machine gunned many of the inmates in the courtyard, as near the entrance of the camp, and the we we seen these bodies. We we, we were not faced by dead people, but uh, the, we'd, we'd seen dead people on Utah Beach and in the Battle of the Bulge and, and, <clears throat> and many other places. But the cruelty that we saw besides the dead people was just unbelievable. <clears throat> I went up and looked at one of these dead bodies that was naked, had four bullet holes in the body, not a drop of blood come out of any of the holes. Just a little yellow substance oozed out. The uh, we 
we went into the camp and, and their bodies piled up like cordwood. They were in piles on the ground and they were stacked in, in, uh, in flatbed trucks and, and wagons. And we were uh, about 15 miles or so from Buchenwald. We, Ordiff didn't have the crematories or the gas chambers, so they, they sent a lot of their, their victims over to Buchenwald for cremation and gas. But uh, they, they couldn't handle them all, so uh, Buchenwald and Ordiff, they dug huge pits in the ground, maybe as big as this room. It sounds big, but it's, they were big pits and deep, and they threw the bodies in these pits and some of them were still alive when they threw them in, but they were all skin and bones. Uh, we were, uh, when we first got in there, our, our GIs were, were uh, given some of our army rations to the, the prisoners. And the, 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 the highest ranking doctor in the American army there, he, he ordered everybody to stop feeding these people. He says, you're killing them. And uh, they, that, or they would actually die within a few minutes after eating our food, because our food was so rich, what they needed was some thin soup. And, but anyway, that they were so hungry, just, uh, just like he said, they, that, or they'd eat anything. We went in the <clears throat> inside the barracks, one of the barracks, they had many, many barracks in this camp. and. Uh, on each side of the, ca uh, the barracks was four shelves for the people to lie on. There were no straw, no blankets, no nothing. And there's four shelves deep and we went in there and the people in the, in the shelves would look up at us with their eyes were large and their stomachs were sunken and they'd reach out at us. And men and women lived in these barracks together and, the, and, the, and they lost all dignity in these barracks. They had an outhouse type toilet in the center of the barracks. And the men and women we would use this toilet inside the barracks and be, the, between the smell of the outhouse toilet and the diseased bodies and the dead bodies in these barracks, the smell was so horrible we had to exit the barracks. These barracks are made out of one by siding, vertical siding, and you know how wood shrinks. And that's all there was on the outside wall, no insulation, no nothing. So there was a, a space between each board, a crack for the wood of, would sink, it would shrink. And in the winter, it must have been terribly, terribly cold. And in the summer, it was horribly hot. Uh, <clears throat> and anyway, this, this, uh, this same camp, uh, uh, after we were there, two days after we were there, we lived, I, I was only in the camp for about a half a day, but two days after I was there, the General Eisenhower, General Patton, and General Bradley visited the camp. They wanted to see for themselves the horror stories they had heard about. The, uh, there were so many, many miserable sights in this place. It was just horrible. Uh, after we was in the camp for about two hours, somebody found a, a Nazi soldier hidden in a culvert at the entrance of the camp. And the, the, the American GIs pulled him out of this culvert and it looked like everybody wanted to lynch him right there. And they probably would have done, but the MPs took this soldier, this Nazi soldier away. And of course, I don't know what happened after that. The, uh, <clears throat> these, uh, the, the German army had some of the finest military machinery in the world, but they also had horse-drawn uh, uh, cavalry and horse-drawn artillery pieces. And when, uh, these, these German roads were really small and our heavy equipment couldn't hardly pass the, uh, each other on the roads. They were so narrow. but. Uh, the, uh, the American uh, Air Force would find these uh, horse-drawn artillery units and they machine gun and bombed them. And, and, and uh, this, uh, when, they, when the 
prisoners were, I was going to say first, uh, you older people remember coming down any Utah Canyon Road years ago, and you'd run onto a, a herd of sheep or a herd of cattle in the spring and fall, taken up or down the canyon for, for grazing. But when the, the uh, Jewish prisoners were liberated, they, uh, they had nowhere to go, but they were on these roads. They had no clothes, they had no money, they had no food, they had no medicine, and they were all starving. And uh, <clears throat> to compound this, the German population in these German cities were, were uh, fleeing the Russians. And between the German citizens fleeing the Russians and the Jewish prisoners on these roads, the, the, uh, <clears throat> the roads were so thick with people we could hardly get through. And after the Air Force would bomb and strafe these horse-drawn uh, artillery pieces and that, they, the, the, the debris was so thick, they had to, the Army engineers had to come up and bring their big cats and, and get ahead of the, of the tanks and that and push all this material off to the side of the road. They pushed off dead horses, dead people. <coughs> And, and war machines that were destroyed. And we, we actually seen the, the Jewish survivors and the German refugees, they didn't want to be captured by the, the uh, communists. But these people would actually go up to these dead horses that had been maybe dead for a day or two or even more. And they were cutting off pieces of meat just so they could eat these, off of these dead horses. Uh, <coughs> Uh, the survivors, they had a horrible time because they had nowhere to go. And the German refugees were, they were pulling hand carts and wheelbarrows and wagons. And of course, most of them just had what they had on their back. But all these people on the road made it difficult for the, our army to get through. And uh, uh, Every year I get invited to the, the uh, Jewish Holocaust Memorial in Salt Lake City. I've been going up there for years to the Holocaust Memorial and Rabbi Benny Zippel greets everyone and they have a speaker. They even have a speaker every year that is from a, a Jewish survivor. The first year I went up, we had about eight liberators there and a handful of survivors. I went up this last spring and there, I was the only liberator present and there was two or three survivors. They're all dying off. One day, uh, many years ago, we had a, a Holocaust and the church's symposium here at the BYU. And this was many years ago, maybe 25 years. But this organization traveled the whole world. They've been to Australia and South America and all of, all of this countries in Germany and many of these United States. And I was showing some pictures of Holocaust pictures I have. And <clears throat> these, these, these Jewish survivors were looking at these pictures that I, I obtained when I worked at the, I worked at the IG, IG Farben building in Frankfurt at General Eisenhower's headquarters after the war. And uh, I was showing these pictures to the survivors present and this one man he says that's me in the corner up there of that picture <clears throat> and this man had had just escaped uh, Germany and and he lived in in Oregon at the time so I, I don't know anything about him after that but he showed me the tattoos on his arm and and uh, anyway he said that's me in the corner of that picture and I'm not supposed to take too much time, but I thank you for letting me talk here, and I know that freedom is not free. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I met the 
after the war, the one that was in the Polish army, through a cousin, we traveled after that, and I, like I told you, we were in Bergen-Belsen, and I ran into a first cousin, and she was liberated. She didn't know anything about the escape. She survived, and I'm going to Poland. Do you want to go with me? Of course, I said no. <laughs> I said, I didn't even want to be with the British, let alone go to Poland. So I said, no, but if you go there, and if you happen to run into your brother, maybe your brother knows of my brother. They're not different in ages. She and her brother was much older. My brother was, I don't know, he was 10 years older than I was, the one in the Polish army. And then I said, if you find your brother, see if you can find him too. I don't remember how, how he came over by boat or by plane, that I don't remember. But he came and located me. I was in the displaced person camp. And the first thing I asked him, I said, where do we have a sister in America? All I know is she's in America, because every soldier was willing to write for me, put it in the paper for me, call for me, but I didn't know where she lived. All I know is America. America is too big. You can't do that. But so what happened is, when he came, he narrowed it down. She's in the Washington area. So that was a good deal right there, right there. She started investigating. And then it happened, and on, by, on our benefit, it happened that she married a first cousin and maintained the same name, the same last name. Spelled a little different. They spelled it G-R-E-E, -E, and we spelled it in Poland G-R-Y-N-B-A-U-M. So it was kind of close. We started investigating with the HIAS, the organization, and they came out that we are the brothers of the sister who lives in the Washington area. And it took a year, she sent papers for us, and the two of us immigrated to America. We came in June, I was liberated April the 25th, 1945. June of 46, I was already in New York, watching all the cars flying all of a sudden. Back and forth, I say, how do they don't, don't hit each other? Why do you have them flying there? And uh, German was a Beinhof, I saw them flying there too. But in New York with those bridges, I was very overwhelmed with that. Anyway, my brother took me, uh, they, with, my sister didn't come to pick us up. We couldn't usually, if, if you uh, receive a package, I call ourselves packages, the sister should have come. The sister, sister was pregnant, she couldn't travel. It happened so that the brother who escaped with the Polish soldier came and picked us up. So mind-boggling, I said, Dave, how did you get to America? He said, I came here in 1941. I said, good for you, you're good. I, I said, if you had let me run away with you in 1939, I would have been in America. So he started telling me what, how much problem he had over there. Believe me, zero. <laughs> Probably, he wound up in Wilno, Lithuania. I don't know whether that Polish soldier ran away with him all the way there, I don't know, but he had a little help in Vilno, Lithuania, I don't know if you, anybody is aware, they had a Japanese ambassador, but the last name was Shukaharo. I don't remember if it was his first name or last name. He has helped Hasidic Jews with false passport to go to Manchuria, and he helped my brother a little bit, and between him and the brother and the, and the ambassador and my sister, he came in 1941. So anyway, he came, picked us up, and he brought us over to the sister's house. And she already fixed up an attic for us with hardwood floors like this. And I wasn't used to it. To me, it was a, like a five-star hotel where I came from. So I didn't complain. My older brother already had a room in the, in the house. She had a four-bedroom house or three-bedroom house. She had the kids, too. So uh, me and my the brother in the Polish army wound up in the headache. And the attic with two big fans, they didn't have any air conditioning in those days. But it was nice, we didn't complain. And we stayed with my sister one year, then we went each other's way. I lasted one year, and then I got married within a year. I met this young lady, and I said, that's it. I don't want nobody else. And the poor thing didn't even finish high school, but don't, don't listen to me. <laughs> Get the education first. And I didn't listen, and I said, I didn't let her finish high school. I said, you go, but after we get married, you go back to finish. And she did exactly that. 
and we lived together 63 years. I have four children. I had with uh, three sons and a daughter, 12 grandkids, and six great-grandchildren. And my, my wife passed away I was about three years ago. I was married for 63 years. When I saw her, I said, I don't want to look at her other place. This is me right there. And I got married. So, so some of you guys that are out there that haven't figured this out yet, you listen to what That's right. Say. But don't you listen with education. To get your education. I made sure my kids are educated. Oh, yes. Well, we were like a scapegoats, I guess, for them. Everything they were blaming on us. They didn't have any food, the Jews ate it all up. They, they, they broke, the Jews had all the money, they didn't have it. Only 1% only of Jews in the whole Germany, only 1% of Jews. How much damage can they do to a country like Germany? But they hated them and they sent them out of the country and they sent them into Poland. They deported every one of them. And uh, every German would say, Oh, I'm a German, they can't do that to me. Second, there was a Jew. But first, a German. I'm a German, right there. But they, he treated them just as bad. But why they did it, that's the only thing to say. I say is a scapegoat, why he hated us. Do you have anger about uh, your experiences? Oh, I'm not angry. Uh, we have incidents at the museum, and sometimes people come and they, they they are, uh, go on the fourth floor, and when they see all these atrocities is done, they come down from there, and the people tell them that if you want to see a survivor, they are at such and such desk. And we usually two of us at a, at a desk sitting there. They come crying. They come over. What are you crying about? We cried enough, but you don't need to cry anymore. <laughs> oh, we Germans, we are ashamed of ourselves. I'm looking at the person. The person is 30 years old, 25 years old. What have I got against them? I don't have nothing against them. I said, I have nothing against Germany, only the ones that caused the Nazis, that caused this problem. Maybe it was your grandfather or great-grandfather, but definitely I don't have anything against you. In fact, I give you a hug, and we hug and we make friends. <laughs> Keith, how about you? Any, any anger or any feelings about your service that you wish you wouldn't have had, or? Well, I'm glad I had the experience. I'm glad I had the experience, but I wouldn't want to do it again. But, uh, I, I have hard feelings against some things, yes, even today. Okay. I, uh, the, the Nazis were so cruel, and the, they were so inhumane, and so many millions of people suffered. There's over six million, six million Jews died, wasn't there? Six million. six million and a million and a half children. And then there was also six million other undesirables that died that, besides the Jews. So there was just priests, yes. murdered priests, communists, Seventh day Adventists. He killed a lot of them, not only Jews. But then gypsies? Yeah. Handicapped. He, gypsies and handicapped people and homosexuals and, yes. and all kinds of people that didn't confirm to their belief why they, they were exterminated. And uh, <clears throat> it's hard to get over that. And after you see this, the suffering, especially like Henry, he, he's seen so much suffering. And I... I I mean, he, he went through the suffering. I've seen some of it, but he lived it. So uh, and there's so many people that were used as for experimental purposes and, and medical, medical uh, practices, and they did it without any anesthetic, and it was, it was unbelievable. And we, uh, we live in a country now that is is above all other countries for compassion, but I, th I think that we, on my street and your street, there's people that would do the same thing if they, if they got a hold of the power to do it. People, there's a lot of evil people in the world today. Okay, Kent. Henry, why do you, it would 
would seem hard to relive this and tell it all the time. Why do you go around telling people your story when it's probably very hard to do? It is hard. It gets easier as I go along and older because I get it out of my system, but I'll never forget it. And we promised one another on that dead march, if you survive, make sure you tell your story, what they did to us. In fact, we thought nobody's going to be alive. And that's what I keep my promise. I'm still at the museum and I talk to children, high school, middle school, universities, whoever I can talk to. I never refuse an invitation if I could tell my story. More people are aware of it. And we still have some people, deniers. There's a witness right there. A witness, how else can you? Don't believe me, believe him. Maybe I put the number on myself. I don't know how. I don't know what to tell. I know I was there, you know, and these non-believers, they say it don't happen. It didn't happen. So we appreciate the, the uh, liberators when we get together and thanking them for what they did and try to remember us. But you were like a witness to us. Thank you. And we're losing uh, our World War II vets at about 1,000 to 1,200 a day. Um, and shortly, uh, there won't be World War II vets left. Keith, same question to you, though. Why do you keep telling your story? Well, <clears throat> I think it has to be told. I, I speak at a lot of schools and churches around, and, and the young people, they don't know much about World War II at all. And some of the things you tell them, they, they don't believe anyway. But uh, as long as they keep asking me, I'll, I'll keep telling. My story that I usually tell goes from the time I landed on Normandy Beach till we met the Russians in Czechoslovakia, but I was just supposed to tell a little bit about the con concentration camps today. Thank you. She asked if before you came into Ordruf, did you know what you could expect going into a concentration camp? No, that's the first we ever knew about it. We never heard of the concentration camps before. And uh, they say Eisenhower and the hierarchy knew about uh, had heard about it, but they didn't really know anything. That's why two days after we, or two days after I was at the concentration camp in Ordruf, why Eisenhower, Patton, and Bradley come and visit us to see the, for themselves what the horrors they've heard about. And it even shocked them. I, I, there's a story that goes around and says, uh, General Patton, he, he, he uh, got sick and vomited after he seen the, after he seen the, the bodies and things and the horrible things they did.